So as you come down the tubule, you go from the cortex, which remember what hangs out in the cortex. You have two things, essentially. You have most of your proximal tubule as well as your glomeruli. Some of your distal tubule will be in there, but a majority of the work that happens uh, in the distal tubule happens in the medulla. So, however, when we're doing kidney biopsies on children or adults in the case of, uh, of trying to obtain a diagnosis, we want the glomeruli because that's where most of the disease process comes from. That's what gives you your glomerular filtration rate, which is around 100 mLs per minute per 1.73 meters squared. But we're, that is a, a different lecture. So what happens is, if your fluid coming down through, this is the lumen side, this is obviously the, uh, the interstitial side, your water coming down, as you guys know, because you are in first uh, year of medical school, which my residents, and often residents don't know, maybe the renal fellows know this, you come to the countercurrent multiplier system. This is the deep, dark dungeon of the kidney, and of the body, actually because what happens here is stuff becomes very concentrated in the interstitium and it becomes very acidic. So your, your sodium, your potassium, your some phosphate that didn't get all reabsorbed, your some amino acids that didn't get reabsorbed, and you're going to end up getting dumped later on. But all the fluid, so you drank a lot today, all the fluid and those electrolytes come down, they're in the medulla now. So 1,200 milliaws moles per liter, which is very, very, very concentrated. And thus, what happens by osmosis or by uh, concentration gradient, water is allowed to enter into the interstitium here. So all the water gets drained out at this point, most of it. gets sucked into the interstitium. These electrolytes that are following it bounce off one another because they're all compact together, and you run into a cell on the thick ascending limb, which is lined with these particular cells, and this is where the Lasix or the loop diuretic channel is, uh, is uh, formed at. And what happens there is two sodium, I, I mean one sodium, one potassium, and two chloride get reabsorbed through a pump that actually allows sodium, potassium, and chloride to get reabsorbed. So you have, it's called the Na, N, you know, it's, it's the fluorosamide or, or actually loop diuretic channel. So one potassium, one sodium, and two chloride get reabsorbed. And there's per pericellular transport of uh, calcium there. So what happens is if you're very dehydrated, all the water gets sucked in, and then you hit these cells, and all of a sudden, all the sodium and potassium gets reabsorbed, and also the chloride. Now, if you were, if you were in a high renin state because you had re renal artery stenosis or some narrowing of the artery, or you threw a clot in that vessel, or there's scarring on your kidney, then this glomeruli in those regions are going to think that it needs to reabsorb sodium because it's got to reabsorb sodium in water because renin's been sent out in order to, to cause angiotensin II to squeeze down on the afferent arterial so that you reabsorb water instead of filtering all this water and sodium. However, if it makes it by there, the next thing that's going to come into account is the countercurrent multiplier is going to pull all the water back in, and then in order to establish your intervascular volume, you're going to reabsorb sodium because that is the number one uh, extracellular ion which maintains your actual, uh, which maintains your intervascular volume and perfuses your, uh, uh, or, uh, perfuses your vital organs. So what happens then is we end up coming up if you're a molecule, say you bounce by, you know, you're very concentrated and you, you, if you're, if you're hydrated and you don't need to reabsorb more sodium or potassium or chloride at this point or your calcium, then you just sweep by those. The auto feedback me mechanism is not in place and then what ends up happening is water rushes back in because you start to, you, the, 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 uh, 
there's aquapor channels here, uh, which become very porous to water because this is very concentrated. The, the, the substrate that's in the actual uh, tubule becomes very concentrated. Water rushes back in, and then you go up into the distal tubule. However, before we move on from there, I would like to point out to you what diuretic works here. And I already called it the Lasix channel, the furosemide channel. The other thing that works here is Bumax, which is another loop diuretic, or acrylic acid or E-acid also works here too. And what it does is it blocks this mechanism to reabsorb. So if you give somebody Lasix, what you're effectively doing is you're blocking their ability of their sodium to reabsorb. For instance, you're in congestive heart failure. So we often like to say in nephrology, no CO, no cardiac output equals no PP. And I'm not referring to the letter P, I'm referring to urination. So if you don't perfuse your kidneys with cardiac output, then what ends up happening is the kidney thinks it's not seeing blood flow. It sends renin out, which then in turn sends his angiotensin II out, which in turn is going to mean you retain fluid. That's why not only does, do you, does your interstitial space become fluid overloaded, you get dependent edema because your cardiac output's not working plus you're retaining sodium and water because your angiotensin II system's turned on. Thus, people like to give Lasix. What Lasix does is it stymies the reabsorption of some of the sodium. The chloride allows you to piece some of that out so that you're not retraining as much water. Okay, then as the, as the substrate or the fluid moves interluminally up, it picks up all that water, so if, now if you're a sodium molecule, you bounce off because you've got some water intervening here, and then what ends up happening is when you go by this area right here is where the macula densa hangs out, the MD. And guess what? The better the urine flow and the more of the chloride in there, the less you're going to see um, the macula densa and the gesture glomerular apparatus throw out renin. In this case, what happens is it shuts off the renin because that's what usually excretes the renin, and therefore you do not cause vasoconstriction at that particular time up here in the afferent arterial. The macula densa controls your renin situation. However, you're in congestive heart failure. The pump's not working to get fluid there. Your volume depleted intervascularly, once again, you're not seeing the blood flow that you would normally see. Patients with liver cirrhosis that have a low albumin state have a lot of dependent edema. Their total body fluid overloaded, however, their intervascular space is limited because it's gone into the dependent areas, into the interstitial bed. Therefore, your blood flow to your kidneys is down. Therefore, your renin state is high. Therefore, your angiotensin state is high. You're going to vasoconstrict and you're going to reabsorb your water and sodium in that case. Therefore, you become more swollen. It's just a matter of the kidney does not see the intervascular volume that it should. As water rushes in, though, in the normal state, what ends up happening is you run into another channel up here. We'll call it in the tubule and the collecting duct or in the distal tubule. It's really a collecting duct. You see the thiazide channel. And the reason it's called the thiazide channel is because that's where the thiazide diuretics work. This here, like this side was the lumen side on the loop diuretic. This is the, the basolateral side or the interstitial side that gets reabsorbed. In this case, what you see is this is the luminal side, and you see a sodium and a chloride, but it's a one-to-one -one here, as well as you get magnesium reabsorbed. Now, magnesium and, chlora and calcium are perilor cellular transported. And the easiest way to remember this, although this is a simplified method of learning this rather than um, uh, memorizing it, the way I do it is, whenever you're dumping too much sodium and potassium, the kidney's like anything else. It's like any other muscle. It's going to be low. It's going to be lazy. Thus, if you can get rid of one ion with two positively charges, to maintain the two negative charges that you're losing in chloride, then you'll send the calcium out. So sooner or later, you're going to lose too much sodium and too much potassium, and kidney's going to say, I'm not, throwing, I'm not going to reabsorb those guys anymore. 
uh, I'm not going to throw those guys out because I have to send two of them. I'm going to send one calcium out. The same thing happens up here with the, with the sodium and chloride, in which case, instead of sending two, uh, sending two sodiums out every time, you're just going to send one uh, magnesium molecule. The difference between these two is calcium forms stones. Magnesium is an inhibitor of stones. Thus, if you're on a thiazide diuretic, you tend to not form stones. If you're on a loop diuretic, such as Lasix or Bumax, you tend to form stones. Okay? So, the bottom line here is that this works through an ATPase pump. If you give thiazides, and this would normally be reabsorbing the chloride and the sodium, if you give a thiazide diuretic, it blocks the mechanism. You're going to dump your sodium and chloride. But since it's diluted at this point, and you're not going to get the bang for your buck that you did when you give Lasix, your fractional excretion of sodium with Lasix is around 15%. With the thiazides, it's around 5%. Therefore, when somebody's in pulmonary edema or you need to get rid of a lot of fluid and a lot, a lot of sodium, then you're going to use Lasix more so than thiazides. However, if they're going to be on a long-term diuretic, thiazides tend to be the way to go. They don't form stones with them because you lose magnesium. And the other case is you don't keep them in a chronic volume depleted state, which they will be with the Lasix. Okay? If you have a defect, in your thighs, in your uh, in your channel, which is known as the loop diuretic channel, then what you have is a, a syndrome known as Barter syndrome. Children are born with that, in which case their aldosterone state's high, their renin state is high, they're chronically volume depleted, they don't grow very well because they're always drinking, and they're avid salt cra cravers because it's like they're on Lasix all the time. Now, the the thiazide diuretic channel, or the thiazide channel, likewise has a syndrome associated with it, and it's known as Gettleman's syndrome. And with Gettleman's syndrome, what ends up happening is you lose chloride and you, you lose uh, sodium, just like you do in Barter syndrome, because it's like the loop diuretics turned on. In this case, it's like the thiazide diuretics turned on. But keep in mind that your only fractional excretion is only 5%. The rest of the kidney is going to make up here at the loop diuretic through iterations or in a distal tubule or in a proximal tubule. That sodium and chloride is going to get reabsorbed. So only when you become volume depleted from another source such as having diarrhea or vomiting will this be more pronounced with the thiazide. So Gettleman syndrome tends to be a, a version of Barter syndrome. In, in a sense, but it works with the thiazide channel. They tend to not form stones or have nephrocalcinosis, tend to excrete more magnesium, and these children tend to not show up until later in life. These ones show up almost congenitally or within the first few years of their life. Now we talked about acetazolamide over here. Acetazolamide, I told you, blocks is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It stinks as a diuretic. It sucks as a diuretic. As a matter of fact, what ends up happening is the sodium and chloride, as you can see, gets reabsorbed throughout the rest of the tubule. So if you block sodium and chloride up here, the only thing that you're effectively doing is reducing their reabsorption of bicarbonate, in which case what that ends up doing when you reabsorb, uh, when you can't reabsorb bicarbonate, you're giving them a renal tubular acidosis like we talked about. Uh, if all these mechanisms for reabsorption of, in the proximal tubule down, it's a famous Italian's last name, that's known as Fanconi. So the syndrome you see here in the proximal tubule is Fanconi's, Barter syndrome, Gettleman syndrome. The three diuretics, acetazolamide or Diamox, which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, stinks as a diuretic, good to get rid of bicarbonate. Great diuretic, Lasix, fractional excretion is 15%, uh, blocks uh, both your sodium, your potassium, and 2-chloride, and then, then the thiazide diuretics in between with 5% being blocked, and you excrete your sodium and chloride.